Well, what's going on now? Yields are rising, stocks are falling, and we have hack attacks. Just as we're transitioning into a digital economy and the government needs a whole lot more taxpayer money. All this and so much more coming up. I'm Lynette Zhang, Chief Market Analyst here at ITM Trading, a full service physical gold and silver company specializing in custom strategies to help you walk through the reset that everybody should well be aware of has already begun. And it's been a very, very interesting week for sure. But I'm going to tell you, don't worry about inflation. After all, that's a good thing we're told. And oh, don't worry about the deficits either. Fed Chair Powell was in the hot seat this week and it was really kind of interesting. Now is not the time to think about budget deficits. Frankly, it's never the time to think about budget deficits and spending more money than we take in. I mean, this only goes through 20, uh, this does not reflect anything from 2021. This is a surplus and deficit at the Fed. You can see where, this is 2008. You can see where we were through 2020, but the reality is, is we have printed a whole lot more money and taken on a whole lot more deficits than this. Do you really, really, really think this is not having an impact? And they're trying so desperately to generate inflation, but wow, he sure doesn't see a burst in spending leading to high inflation because it's all going into the stock market, the bond market, the real estate market, but it's also going into other people's pockets, which I'm going to show you that in just a minute, but nah, and don't forget about that um, massive amount of liquidity that we expect to see coming out of the treasury and going back to the Fed within a weekish or so. And additionally, he's warning us. Now remember the setup. First, they had a 2% inflation target, which they never met since 2008. Although if you look at what you buy and use every day, it's really more like 10%, not under 2%. But that's another story for another day. Then they went to an average target of 2%, justifying their numbers running above that 2% inflation rate. And they're warning us, inflation may be volatile over the next year. But frankly, it's not like prices go up and then prices go down. Prices go up and then they go up and then they go up and then they go up. You see what I'm saying? So this is all garbage for sure. And you have to think about it. So I want you to know that you, we, all of us have been warned about the massive inflation that he knows is coming between the treasury deluge and the government and their own deluge. I mean, it's, it's everybody's working in concert here and boy, they will push that inflation because they don't have any other tools. Now, yesterday there was a seven year bond auction and frankly, uh, Rick Santelli can say it much better than I can. So I'm just gonna let him do that. Man like right now, Rick. How's no. this? I'm holding my nose for anybody watching the radio. This was not a good auction. Matter of fact, this might be one of the worst auctions I've graded ever. First of all, it's 62 billion, which is tied for the record size. The last auction for sevens was 62. Two years ago, these auctions were like 32 billion. Just to give you an idea. The yield at the Dutch auction was 1.195, which is like four basis points above where it was trading in the one issued market. Higher yield, lower price. That pretty much says it all. That gives you your D minus right there. Now, when we go through the numbers, it's sort of shocking. The bid to cover, 2.04, 
I couldn't even find a 2.04 since the seven years been around. Uh, 38.1 was indirect. That's the worst since Thanksgiving of 2013. And if we look at the only bright spot, direct bidders at 22.1, best since December of 19. Hedge funds, mutual funds, they jumped in to some extent, but nobody else did, which meant primary dealers took the most they've ever taken since September 2014, a whisker under 40%. These numbers are atrocious, but it shouldn't be shocking considering how much higher yields have moved over the last several weeks. Andrew, back to you. Okay, I need a prediction, though, on the 10-year, because everybody's going crazy about where that's trading at right now. We just hit over 1.5 here, and the whole equity market is trading off of it. Yeah, no, I think we're going to definitely do some pausing in the 150 to 155 area. But I think ultimately, Andrew, I told Joe uh, this about a month and a half ago, ultimately 1.67 is my next real resistance level in 10 year, no yields. But don't underestimate the low 150s. We have some key bottoms there from about a year and a half ago. Okay, Rick. Okay, so is the appetite for treasury bonds declining? That was a D minus. You heard all of that just at a time when the government is not just releasing a lot of liquidity back to the Fed and into the markets. It'll be force fed into the markets, but also at a point when the government is issuing a tremendous amount of debt. Now, here's the, here's the key because rates are rising globally. This is not just happening in the U.S. This is a synchronized movement. So we need to be aware of that. But the yield, the dividend yield is at 1.57 on average on the S&P 500. So when we get 10-year yields near that level, that's why you're seeing the stock markets decline. Because the bond markets are saying this inflation is not good. I don't care what Fed Chair Powell says. It is not what's about to happen. I mean, it's a tsunami. The system is breaking down. What can I say? But if you listen to the talking heads, what are they saying? Relatively speaking. So when you had interest rates on the 10-year, which is the bedrock of the global financial system, down below 1%, and you could get a better yield on stock, that was justification for the stock market's rise. There's lots of reasons why the stock market's rising. And all of it has to do with leverage and debt and margin, which is more debt, more leverage. But these rising yields could well be the pinprick that we go into a major correction at. I don't know because they want to keep these markets flying. So how can they do that? Well, there are a number of ways that they can do that. More QE, free money, but Let's look at the fact that we are now moving closer and closer to universal basic income. I thought this was really quite interesting. Some families, these are families that make 150,000 that would qualify for a whole bunch of benefits to get stimulus and tax credit at $14,000. And what I also found super interesting is that this new plan, which is not fully passed yet, it's going to the Senate, but the new plan would enable families to receive the child tax credit payments on a monthly basis. So we are definitely moving closer and closer to UBI because part of what we've seen in all of this has been the rise of the individual investor. I mean, if you're making 75000 150000 you know, to some people that sounds like a lot because the average income in 2020 was about 48,000. And I'm going to show you that in a minute as well. So, you know, you're, you're looking at getting stimulus checks and these do not include the enhanced unemployment benefits. So if somebody qualifies for all of that, they're getting more than 14,000 a year and breaking it down into monthly payments. Interesting. So should this pass, it is also reconfiguring the social safety net, which 
we saw how well that worked. I mean, I personally know people that certainly qualified independent uh, massage therapists, et cetera, that absolutely qualified under the new plan for unemployment benefits that didn't get them, didn't get them. So it's not that everybody that qualified could get them, but it is reconfiguring the social safety net to include UBI. A test of universal basic income has arrived in the United States. If these families don't need all of this money, because there's a lot of it that's going into savings, which is also kind of, as we talked about the other day, creating some headaches for the banks to absorb that treasury cash. I mean, we are between a rock and a hard place, but we are a consumer-driven economy. They've got to keep the economy at least and giving it an appearance of being okay. UBI is here today. We are moving closer and closer to hyperinflation. And of course, Japan in many ways shows the way to keep these markets rising. Now, I'm not saying that Japan is in hyperinflation, but we all know that they have been in deflationary mode since the early 90s, and they've never been able to pull out of it. And so the way that they have kept their stock markets going is by buying up the markets for both stocks and bonds. Now, we're doing the bonds $120 billion a month, and that's as far as the eye could see. And we're even doing some things in the corporate debt market, et cetera. But, you know, Bank of Japan has been really the first to do so many things. And they have now become the biggest stock owner. So they're really also picking the winners and the losers. You tell me who has more fiat than those that can create it, the central banks the government pension agencies, etc. cetera. 74, in, in 2018, they were already at 75% of the total ETF market. So is that going to come here? Yeah, I'm thinking it will. We'll wait and see. Time is going to tell. But I love this because this just came out recently. Jap Japanese stocks passed 1990 high as economic recovery accelerates. I mean, you just can't make this stuff up. Do, 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 you, do you really think that nobody pays attention to the fact that these stocks are making new highs because the Bank of Japan is buying them? Yeah. I mean, it's really ridiculous. And you have to ask yourself, just because the stock market is back to 1990 levels, right? It's past 1990 levels. It's not up to there yet, mind you. Does it really make the economy better if the stock market rises, but the real economy is floundering? Because that's what's happening here too. No, it doesn't make it better. It just makes things a lot more extreme. And we are moving into the digital age. And there are things that we have to really pay attention to. And you have to think about what could happen once everything, well, not everything, because obviously we've got to live in a tangible house and sit on a tangible chair and drink from a tangible glass. But what happens when we hold our equity and our wealth in digital form? What could possibly happen with that? We've talked about the solar winds hack attack back in um, January. But here it's coming back again because, of course, now key players are in front of Congress explaining things. Microsoft president, I love this. Do you love this? Because we're just going about our lives. We're not paying attention to any of this. We'll go online. We buy things. We do things. They want us to hold all of our wealth in digital form. You know, the, the equity in your house. So it makes it easier to transfer that wealth. And it also makes it easier to steal it. But the only reason that we even knew about the SolarWinds hack is because FireEye told us, one of the agents told us. 
The massive hack into government systems through a software contractor would have remained unknown by the public if not for one company's decision to be transparent about a breach to its systems. And that was Microsoft President Brad Smith telling lawmakers at that hearing. Okay, how many of these hacks do we not know about? Because it poses a risk and a, and a legal risk to the companies. Cybersecurity interest incidents, I like they say, can potentially go undisclosed. Most of them do go undisclosed until it's leaked or there's some other problem that comes up. So now they're talking about cybersecurity, private sector companies should be required to be transparent about significant breaches of their systems. Well, let's see what systems were hacked. There were a hundred companies and at least nine or 10 government agencies, Commerce Department, Treasury, Defense, State Department, Department of Homeland Security, and recently admitted Department of Justice. These were all hacked, but you know, can we feel secure as the US dollar is becoming a digital dollar? and they get rid of cash? This is why I keep telling you, you want to have a real diversified portfolio, not Wall Street's version where you have stocks and you have bonds and you have ETFs and you have mutual funds. You heard Rick Santelli say, who's buying whatever little bit of bonds that were bought? Mutual funds, entities that spend your money. You're the one that takes it on the shorts if that's what you're invested in. That's why it's important to have physical gold and physical silver in your possession that you can convert as needed. I do not intend to hold a whole lot of digital dollars. I intend to hold a, lo a whole lot more gold and silver and convert as needed. Additionally, the reason why it's a complex issue to have the companies disclose is because of all the liabilities companies face when they go public about a disclosure. They have shareholder lawsuits. They have lots of considerations of business impact. You know, we were hacked. Maybe we don't want to do business with them. You also don't want to unnecessarily create a lot of fear, uncertainty, and doubt. No, why would you want anybody to make an educated choice? My goodness, that's crazy talk. Let's just keep it all hidden so that when it happens, you cannot be prepared. I would rather be 10 years too early than one second too late. And I think you might want to be that too. It may be worse. So here, our government, it may be worth considering greater disclosure requirements, even if it means creating liability protection for companies that follow those disclosure obligations. I mean, <laughs> I don't even know what to say about that. And it's not often I'm speechless as well you guys know. So you gotta ask yourself, do you really feel so secure especially as they transition us into the digital dollar and more on this solar winds. Okay. So that was the 23rd. This is on the 24th. Solar winds, not the only company used to hack targets. So they get in there and then they use the normal channels of the, um, cloud hosting services to access the system. The hackers used a variety of legitimate software and cloud hosting services to access the systems of nine federal agencies. And, and actually it came out after this. So I would say 10 federal agencies and a hundred private companies. Good. Now, do you know if one of the companies that you work with was hacked? I don't know, but they're saying still that the attack is not fully contained. So it's still going on and they haven't gotten rid of it and it's not contained, but you're not really hearing that much about it. Are you? Hmm. 
Because silence, that's the thing. Silence won't solve the problem. Don't look at the man behind the curtain with all of this money printing. Can you see all of these different balls that are being juggled? You think any of them are going to drop? They need disclosure obligation for the private sector, not the government sector, mind you. The private sector needs disclosure obligation. Yeah, that's actually something that I would absolutely want to know. How about you? Because if we can't trust these major technology companies who have now, you know, and been determining who could say what, when, and where, who will protect our identities or at least warn us so that we can protect ourselves. We need to be as independent and self-sufficient as we can possibly be. You need to have wealth that is not inside of this fiat money digital system. You need to have tangible wealth. Absolutely, 100%. Because Microsoft failed to shore up defenses. They've known about it since 2017. They've known about this problem. Microsoft Corp's failure to fix known problems with its cloud software facilitated the massive SolarWinds hack that compromised at least nine federal government agencies. At least because they don't really know how broad spread that hack is. They don't know that yet. It's not contained. It's not contained. I already told you that. Microsoft is for not doing so, who has faulted tech companies, so Whedon, who has faulted tech companies on security and privacy issues, says Microsoft for it, well, hammers Microsoft for not doing more to prevent forged identities or warn customers about it. When do you want to know about any of this stuff? Any of it? Afterwards or before? And are you brave enough to take the steps to protect yourself and make sure that you can sustain your standard of living and take care of your family? Now, now the other day, just before I went on air on Wednesday, um, there was a problem over at the Fed and the system that allows banks to send money back and forth went down and they're saying it was an operational error that took the fed payment system down now mind you they now have the fed now payment system that they're working on to issue the digital dollars right this is so you can have 24 7 access to your money and i'm not really sure what just happened we've got some technical difficulties so bear with us here um Hmm. Hmm. Okay. Okay. Let me, sorry about this, but I want you to be able to see everything. Did that help? Nope. Uh, don't know what happened. Let me try it again. I'll wait a couple of seconds. And then we may go to No? Well, hmm, what shall we do? What do you guys want to do? Would you, do you want us to um, shut down, figure this out, and come back on? Or do you want me to just keep talking? I kind of feel like I'd rather shut down and come back on. Is that what everybody's saying? Give us a second, we'll figure it out. Okay. So stay tuned. We're going to shut down and we will come right back because I have lots more to show you. Lots more.